So we're going to be talking about streaming ingestion made simple. How to build an ice house with Kafka, Iceberg, and Trino. My name is Matt Fuller, co-founder and VP of product at Starburst. And I'm with my colleague here, Eric. Hi, I'm Eric Huang. Um, I'm a distinguished engineer here at Starburst Data and a co-creator of Presto and Trino, and also formerly a technical lead at Facebook streaming ingestion team. Great. So to start, we're going to talk about um, the ice house architecture. What I'm first going to talk about is what is an ice house? An ice house is the leading SQL lake house architecture that provides your teams with a familiar warehouse like experience on a truly open foundation. That foundation being Trino for the query engine and Iceberg for the open table format for where your data is stored. And so why an ice house? This is the next uh, era of uh, the data lake house. And you know, why, why would you want to use a, an ice house? Well, first, it's compatible from the start. Apache Iceberg was designed for Trino. And in fact, the first queries uh, run on Iceberg table were executed with Trino. It's also proven at very large scale. Leading tech companies such as Netflix, Apple, Pinterest, Stripe, and many more leverage this ice house architecture to handle petabytes worth of data without going over budget. Uh, next, it's also SQL based. So it's a very familiar language um, that many, many people know uh, for running analytics. And it does not require you to learn a new uh, skill set. You can simply run SQL uh, with an ice house architecture. And then last, it's open at every layer. As I mentioned, Trino is the open query engine for an ice house architecture, and Apache Iceberg is the open table format for an ice house architecture. And this allows optionality at every level. In order to architect an ice house, um, it is more than just Trino and Iceberg. There are really four capabilities to provide that end-to-end -end warehouse experience. First, there's data ingestion. That's how data lands in the ice house, how you get it in there. Next is how um, the data is accessed and secured once it is in the ice house. You need a data governance layer for that. The third is data management. And this is how tables in the ice house are cleaned and optimized to maintain performance. Um, and a very, uh, very similar to uh, data warehouses where this is done all automatically, an ice house also does this automatically. Whereas in um, traditional or more legacy lake houses or lakes, you have to do this manually and you have to build software around that to do that. And then last, there's automatic capacity management. This is about the compute, how the ice house compute scales up and down to match the demand. So you're not over provisioned or under provisioned. Uh, in this talk, we're going to talk about the data ingestion piece of uh, an ice house architecture. And in particular, we're going to be talking about how to ingest data from Kafka into Iceberg. Um, and there are many common reasons for why you want to do this, but often data is born um, in, in some application somewhere or, or basically uh, um, machine generated in some way. And so certain, you know, some applications for us to be like web applications, it, it would say you want to do some clickstream uh, analytics. Um, or analyze crash reports, or uh, look into how you can improve ad conversion. All that data is being generated in, in the web application. You're typically putting that into Kafka, um, but it needs to go somewhere. And putting that in an, um, in an ice house architecture is a great place for that to go. Um, other examples would be security events. So let's just say you're monitoring um, uh, threat activities on, on uh, uh, on devices and you want to be able to uh, stream those onto a lake for, for analytics or even IoT for near real-time analytics. Let's say you have um, industrial telemetry data that you need to land somewhere. The lake is a, a very good place to, to do that. When you're using Kafka um, uh, as a way to um, bring data into the lake, it's, it's actually very complex to get that um, onto the lake as iceberg tables. Um, there are uh, many uh, off-the-shelf tools uh, you can use either in the open source or 
uh, through a vendor, but they don't provide the end-to-end -end solution. You often have to cobble these tools together. Um, you know, example tools would be Kafka Connect or Flink. It can do some of the, the pieces, but you have to cobble it together. You have to orchestrate it. Um, you might be uh, writing custom software um, using Airflow, Python, Bash, Cron, Java, a lot of work to, to orchestrate that and get that um, into iceberg tables for it to be available uh, for querying. And so here at Starburst, um, we've uh, uh, created um, a streaming ingestion service um, to make uh, ingesting the data from Kafka into iceberg tables uh, very simple. And so all you have to do is within Starburst Galaxy, you um, connect to the Kafka topic and we continuously read from that Kafka topic, um, landing in an associated iceberg table that we've created uh, for you. Now this iceberg table lives in your S3 uh, bucket, um, but we're continuously reading that and landing it into the iceberg table. Um, and we're doing this with exactly one semantics. That means we're not uh, missing any messages from the Kafka uh, topic and we're not reading the messages uh, twice. So you're, you're going to get that exactly once uh, semantics. We're also doing this in near real time. So the data is being um, read from Kafka, parsed and written into an iceberg table. And so from the moment we read it to when it's available for querying is about in, uh, in, in one to two minutes. So it's very near real time. Not only that, we have a background um, data maintenance uh, service that's running to make sure that the data is um, being compacted and, and, and optimized um, uh, fully. And, and the next slide, I'll go into more details there. Um, and then last, you can choose the catalog for which you want these iceberg tables to be cataloged. So here at Starburst, we have um, uh, a built-in catalog into Galaxy that you could use. Um, but if you want to use an external catalog, we support Glue. And in the near future, we'll be supporting Apache uh, Polaris for that catalog as well. A bit more about the data maintenance that we offer. So I mentioned compaction. This is a way to maintain good performance by optimizing the iceberg file sizes. Um, but there are a number of other things you have to uh, know about when using iceberg tables. Uh, snapshot expiration and orphan file remover. Those are two um, ways to re um, reduce storage and deleting kind of um, outdated snapshot or orphan files that are no longer needed. Um, and then we're also doing statistics collection. So stats will be associated um, with those iceberg tables and those are useful for the, um, for the query optimizer. And then last is we have a data uh, retention uh, system where you can set a data retention policy. Say you want the data to, to roll off and expire every 90 days. The data main service is doing that for you. And so this is all done automatically for you and you don't have to um, worry about it. So if I were to summarize iceberg ingestion and maintenance and how we make that easy with Starburst, our product has a very easy to use um, a way to set it up and configure it. And you don't have to worry about it from, from um, uh, that, that forward. Um, so, um, and we'll, talk, we'll show more about that in the demo in just a bit. Um, the other piece we're gonna talk about in the coming slides is we can, um, we can scale this up uh, to very large uh, uh, volumes of data. And we'll go through that in more detail in the coming slides. And then last, what we'll show later is um, the leading price performance, uh, being able to get really good uh, performance uh, for ingesting data in iceberg tables at a very, um, very low cost. And uh, we'll, we'll talk more about that. Um, so this, this capability has been in uh, preview since earlier this year. And what we're announcing today is general availability of streaming ingestion in data maintenance for iceberg tables. And to start and to show the ease of use, I'm going to go into a product demonstration. In this demo, I'm going to show our streaming ingest uh, capability in Starburst Galaxy. And so we have this new concept called data ingest. Um, and in this view, we haven't connected any sources yet. So it's, it's empty. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna click on connect new source and we're gonna um, choose our source. Um, so we can support Apache Kafka, Confluent Cloud and Amazon MSK. 
Uh, for this demo, I'm going to choose Confluent Cloud. Click Next. So first what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a new source and I'm gonna give it a name. I'm gonna call it uh, Demo. Um, you could give it a description. I'm gonna leave it blank. Uh, the next thing you want to do is um, uh, enter in your Kafka brokers. So I'm gonna enter that in. So I'm gonna paste in a Kafka broker. If you have multiple of them, you would um, separate them by commas. Um, next is I'm going to uh, enter in the authentication information to the Confluent Cloud um, cluster. Um, so I'm using the API key and API secret, and then I'm gonna click test. And we were able to successfully connect to uh, the Kafka cluster. So we're gonna click save new source. The next thing we wanna do is we're gonna select the topic to create the um, iceberg table from that we, um, we call live tables. Um, we're gonna select the catalog. Um, so I have one pre-configured called Icehouse. Um, this uh, will create iceberg tables on uh, S3. I'm gonna choose a schema. Uh, I'm gonna call this uh, streaming ingest. I'd already created that. Um, and we're gonna give it a table name. I'm gonna call it stock trades because we are going to be uh, reading data from an example uh, stock trades topic um, through uh, that's coming from Confluence uh, example stock trades um, topic. So we're gonna choose stock trades um, as the, the topic. We also have data retention. Um, here you can specify a retention threshold. Say you want the data to be uh, expired after 90 days, you could choose that. Um, I'm gonna leave it as retain forever. And then we also have um, the ability to choose um, different uh, throughput limits per partition. Um, so uh, I'm gonna uh, keep the selected eight megabytes a second per partition, but there are other options as well as you um, uh, size your system with your, your throughput requirements. Um, and then last, I'm gonna choose a starting point. Uh, we can start from the latest messages or we can um, start from the earliest messages. That means uh, starting from the latest messages, any new messages um, we're going to ingest, but anything that's previously on your, your Kafka topic won't be ingested. If you do this, we're going to go back into the retention period of, um, of Kafka and, and ingest those as well. Um, so I'm going to do this because you're going you're gonna to see how we are able to backfill um, those messages into the um, iceberg table as well as ingest new messages. I'm going to click test connection. and um, we're able to successfully connect. So what we've done so far is we've connected to the uh, Kafka cluster, and now we've set up where we want the table to land. So we're gonna click Create Target. Um, and this, this last piece here is we're specifying a mapping between um, the, the messages from the Kafka topic to how we want it to appear in the iceberg table. So on the Kafka topic, um, they are um, sending JSON messages. We can see here in the message sample, and we're automatically inferring a schema from that JSON data as shown here in the mapping. So we have the, the JSON path to a uh, column name and then uh, the data types. So you could uh, change these, say you want the column names to be different or you have some um, uh, domain knowledge about the data where you want to adjust the types or maybe you don't want a particular column to be ingested, you can, you can choose that. I'm going to leave the default. So I'm going to click Create Live Table and you see that it's being created here. It, start, it takes just a few seconds to start. Um, one thing I also want to note is now that we've set up a Kafka connection, if there are other topics from uh, that Kafka cluster that you want to load, you don't have to re-enter the Kafka credentials. You can simply just go to create live table and, um, and, and choose your, your new um, topic. Um, but I'm going, to go, I'm going to go back. We can see that what we just created was running. So let's query the data. And there you have it. Um, in just a few minutes, um, we were able to connect to Kafka, configure the topic that we want to ingest data from into an iceberg table. And running this query, you see that we've um, in, uh, inserted 990, 
And, and from running this query, you see that we've inserted 990,000 rows approximately. And so I ran the query again, and you can see that we're continuously loading data in. Now we have about uh, 1.3 million rows. So this table is continuously being loaded by, um, uh, um, from Kafka into, into the iceberg table. So that's what I wanted to show for the demo. Thank you. And now I'll hand it over to Eric. All right. So let's talk a bit about how this technology scales. First of all, I think it's great to explain what we mean by scale. Typically, when we talk about scale, people think of data scale, which is really a system's ability to handle large volumes of data in a both performant and in an efficient way, make sure there's no deg degradation as a result. But we're also going to be talking a little bit later about operational scale, which is the amount of effort it takes to actually sustain such a system, given that there's always going to be various data management issues and unintentional human errors. And that's a thing that often gets missed. So we'll be talking about that. So let's start a bit by looking at some of the data scaling challenges when you're trying to move data on your Kafka topic into an iceberg data lake. A little bit on how Kafka actually works. So Kafka, you can think of as a distributed queue of sorts, where you have clients that take data and drop it in the queue, and then you have consumers on the other end that are taking data off the queue and doing something with it. So in our case, our consumers are going to be dealing with um, taking that data and materializing that into your data lake in an, as an iceberg table. Um, and when we talk about the scale of this system, we're typically thinking of how much throughput are we able to get through this system? So we often think of scalable systems as system X being able to ingest X gigabytes of data per second, system Y being able to ingest Y terabytes of data per second, and so on. Now, it's important to also note that if an ingestion process is unable to keep up with the flow of data, then this whole system moves into what we call a backlog state. And in a backlog state, uh, this is where the backlog of data in the queue is getting larger and more than more faster than what the consumer is actually able to consume. And this is something that all Kafka administrators aim to avoid. So with Kafka, a topic is, you can think of as a logical data stream um, that you can subscribe to, but internally it's actually composed of one or more Kafka partitions. And these are sort of the internal cues that it uses which is a form of parallelism. So as you add more Kafka partitions, hence these internal queues, you can have more throughput from the producers at the broker level and also for each of the consumers. And that's just the natural way to scale the system. So as an example, in this case, we have three partitions shown. If each partition is able to dish out one megabyte per second, then the, we say that the total Kafka topic throughput is three megabytes per second. So how does this apply when we're looking at streaming ingestion? Well, we do have a choice when we set up a Kafka ingestion system, which is how many partitions do you assign to one of these consumers to process? So a simple approach as demonstrated here is just to naively assign one partition for each of these consumers. Um, this is great because you get a lot of parallelism but there's a big downside here, which is that if you do this naively, especially for ingestion, you tend to get a lot of little tiny files coming out of this thing, especially when you're talking about near real-time use cases. And why is this a problem? Well, first of all, when you have many, many tiny files, uh, your data lake query performance is going to really suffer. So it's just a lot of IOs for these little bits of data that you're fetching, um, and you're going to really pay for that when at query time. Um, if you're using iceberg, it does get a little bit better because the background compaction system will kick in eventually and sweep up all these small files, make them a little bit larger, and then make it easier to query then. Um, and that will solve the problem. But in the interim, before when that actually happens, the performance is really going to really suffer. Now, what about the other side of this? Well, one thing we could do is we could take all of the partitions and just assign them to just one consumer. Um, in this case, you're going to see that oh, we're going to able we're able to produce uh, very nice large files that are efficient to query. But then we suffer from the problem that the data coming to the system might be more than the single consumer can handle, in which we would be creating the backlog state that I mentioned earlier. 
So practically speaking, you're not going to go to one of one or two of these extremes, right? You want to find uh, a happy balance between these two things. Um, you don't want to have so many consumers, so many ingesters at that parallelism level, such that you have really tiny files, but you don't want to have such few consumers and low parallelism that you're causing a backlog state. So really we're trying to optimize for this point in the graph, right? Which is you just want just barely enough parallelism such that the files are coming out at a nice size, but not so much that it's going to start causing issues. Uh, this is an interesting point because it is different from a lot of the classic Kafka consumers out there. If you use the standard Kafka clients as so many systems do, um, most of them end up optimizing for the right side of this graph and that they optimize for increased parallelism provided that there are, are um, there's capacity available. But for ingestion, you actually don't want that. You want it to bring as far left as possible. And that's what our system is doing. So at Starburst, we've built a fully custom Kafka ingestion solution that considers all of these factors. Um, our architecture considers the load that is currently coming to the system, each of the different tasks, and does a dynamic assignment, packing and unpacking um, these tasks together to create uh, the optimal workload, trying to find that optimal magic point that I showed on, showed on the previous graph. So just as an example, if we look at this current setup, if we were to add a, another partition into this system, um, the load coordinator service that we have would then try to find an optimal place to put it, in which case it chose to put it in that second uh, compute node. And, and it decided that because there was enough capacity to handle it and it would benefit overall from increasing the overall file size. Um, another challenge that is commonly faced when you think about how to consume from Kafka topics and putting them into iceberg tables is how do you actually commit the tables? So with Kafka, uh, with iceberg, Iceberg tables are composed of a series of files that link to each other. At the top of that file structure is called the metadata file. Now to commit a file on the iceberg, you have to replace that top level meta file with another one linking in the new files that you are ingesting. Um, however, iceberg follows a, an optimistic concurrency control mechanism which means that if you have multiple committers coming through the system at the same time, uh, some of them are going to fail because each of them will try to replace that metadata file and only one of them will succeed. So at small concurrency or low concurrency levels, that's usually okay. Um, but as you scale out the system, you're gonna see at some point there, it's just gonna not make much more progress. And empirically, uh, we've seen that this is probably toppling at around somewhere between 10 to 20 concurrent committers at the same time for near real-time data. So clearly, uh, we need a more scalable solution than doing the naive thing here. So at Starburst, our streaming solution includes a custom commit coordination service as well. And so this is a service that coordinates between all of our tasks and helps them to work together to make sure that they don't actually conflict with each other. And it also does some extra work to batch and merge the things together such that the work is really compressed. And all of this happens in the background, so you don't have to think about it at all. And it's just it's just gonna work for you silently in the background. But it's, we thought it'd be great to give you guys a peek at what was actually happening behind the covers here. So just to see how far we could push our system, uh, we ran our system through a series of tests and demonstrated that our system can easily handle Kafka topics with throughputs up to 100 gigabytes per second. And that's without even breaking a sweat. Uh, to put that in perspective, that's equivalent to roughly one petabyte every three hours. And that's, that's pretty huge. Now that we've talked a little bit about data scale, I'm gonna spend some time looking at operational scale. Um, and in many ways we have cool features that we've added that will simplify many of the challenges that data administrators face. So when you've set up your first Kafka application, um, one of the things you're gonna realize is that oftentimes a, a few bad messages might make their way into your Kafka topic. 
for example, imagine if you had a developer who was testing out a new application and they thought they were testing on a, a test Kafka topic, but then they actually accidentally injected it into your production topic. So the problem here is that with Kafka, you can't actually remove things from the queue once it enters. So it's really up to the consumers to figure out how to get rid of them. And in many naive senses, um, most Kafka consumers out there will just kind of balk at a bad message and then they'll just spin and halt and not be able to proceed. And that's what a lot of the current common Kafka to iceberg ingestion systems will do. Um, and this obviously has downstream impact as your, your ETL pipelines and other systems that depend on this data are going to choke on their flow of data until that gets resolved. Um, what we've done here at Starburst is something slightly more sophisticated in that we take these bad messages that we know aren't be, going to be able to be parsed and we inject them into a parallel dead letter table, which is also an iceberg table. And that table is jointly transactional with the loaded table itself. And what that means is uh, these two tables, while different iceberg tables, move in lockstep together such that you can be assured that there's never any moment when any data is either uh, uh, going to be duplicated or lost relative to these two tables. And that's pretty unique for our system and most of the systems that out there that we've surveyed. And in this way, the system will continue to flow. Um, your, your downstream systems aren't going to be affected. And then you can offline just investigate and check and figure out uh, what's going on with these dead letter records and process them later. Now, another common challenge that data engineers will face is potentially misconfiguring the schema when they set it up or using an outdated schema. So let's say, for example, um, uh, as a client, you're trying to set up something for a message that looks like the following, but for the price field, you accidentally put big int instead of what it should be, should have been a double. And maybe you're using an outdated record and didn't realize that the stop loss field was also going to be added at some point very, very soon. And so you just didn't include that in your schema. Now, what's going to happen is as you start running the system, you know, it might work for a little bit, and then you're going to start noticing that, hey, uh, I'm going to, I'm getting some dead letter records or, hey, the system is halting. Um, or I wish, oh, I, I thought I had added this field, but it's not currently there. What do I do? Um, and you may not want to go back and just blow away all the data that you just kind of loaded and start over because maybe there's actually some useful data there already. Um, before you even figure out what to do with the data, you have to figure out what happened altogether. So we've built in a very advanced error detection classification notification system here at Starburst um, such that we can tell you what happened and why it happened very quickly. And as you can see, there's a number of integrations that are going to be provided such that you can be notified on these things. Now, once you've identified these things, obviously you want to then go and fix it. Um, in most other systems, fixing this is not going to be very easy. Uh, for example, if you just had a, if you just accidentally omitted a new column and you want it and you already had a bunch of data loaded, uh, for that column for some time, you're going to want to figure out how to retain what you have already uh, while just fixing what you already, while fixing just the portions that are um, that are impacted. In any other system out there, to do that, you're probably going in and surgically trying to adjust things like Kafka checkpoints and iceberg snapshots, and you're trying to do that and praying that you're probably that you're not going to create any issues for yourself because doing that you can sometimes create data loss or duplication if you're not careful. So I'd like to introduce you to a new feature that we've developed called Reset and Replay. It allows users to first update their schema to what they actually want it to be. Then they go in through the UI and select a point where they want to rewind that table to. And by rewinding the table, you're not really winding just the table state, but also all of the loading state behind it too, such that it will transactionally move back as if you had time traveled that table and then progress forward from that point forward. Um, I should also mention that this whole thing is fully transactional, not just for the table state, the loading state, but also for the dead letter table as well. Another common data incident that uh, we've observed in the past 
is when real-time data systems suddenly create a burst of traffic that enters the queue. Um, and this burst of data can create issues for your downstream data pipelines. And that's because when you have uh, your Kafka topics and consumer set up, usually you're provisioning for a specific size. Now, if that burst vastly exceeds that size, what you're going to get is um, the output will, becoming, will become increasingly more stale as it's chugging through that backlog. So you can imagine that if you had a dashboard running off of the, the result of this data pipeline um, that was supposed to be showing data within the last five minutes, during that case where you have all of this backfill data coming through or all of this, this huge load spike, your dashboard will get increasingly more and more out of date relative to the current time until that backfill has been cleared. At Starburst, uh, we are going to be adding a feature very soon called backfill with recency bias which allows us to prioritize uh, loading the freshest data over the staler data. And what that allows us to do is to start bringing in the data that is coming in that is new off of the topic, while in the background, uh, kicking off another set of loading tasks that load the backlog data such that when all of these processes complete, you can be assured that you are not going to lose any data, but all of your downstream uh, pipelines will still continue to see the freshest data. Uh, I should also mention that this is extremely difficult to achieve in other traditional Kafka systems using the standard clients. And this is possible here because of our fully custom approach. Now to top that off, uh, we have yet another upcoming feature that allows our system to process any backlog or backfill data with multiple parallel consumers for the same Kafka partition. So most other systems that use standard Kafka clients uh, and that protocol basically forces them to process each partition pretty much sequentially. And oftentimes this is implemented using a single thread. Our system, because we do not use the standard, standard client or the standard protocol, uh, we don't have such a limitation. And so the throughput itself is only limited by the speed of the Kafka system itself. So just to recap a bit, uh, the Starburst streaming ingestion system is built for scale from the ground up and it al allows us for very high data volume using these novel techniques, um, as well as operational scale through a number of innovative data management features. Now I'm gonna hand it back to Matt. Oh. I'm gonna hand it back to Matt to cover the price performance. Thanks, Eric. Um, now I'm gonna talk about the, the price performance for our system. So um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, our streaming ingestion system has a leading price performance. Um, that is for uh, the, the throughput, we're going to come in at a very uh, low and competitive cost. And so um, in our benchmark uh, cost study, uh, we, we did a benchmark of uh, eight megabytes a second per throughput. Um, and, and what it comes out to is uh, the monthly cost of um, Starburst Streaming Ingest is $47.16 or an annual cost of $565.92. Um, and, and to put in perspective, this is about six and a half cents uh, per hour per that eight megabyte per second uh, throughput. Um, when we compared to other vendor solutions, uh, in the market, which are also sometimes built on open source um, solutions such as uh, Kafka Connect or, or Flink, um, uh, the solutions come in um, higher. So uh, for example, in vendor one, uh, $79.20 a month, vendor two, $224.00 per month. And then lastly, vendor three, uh, $531.23. Uh, per month. So uh, in addition to um, all the features uh, that, that Eric talked through and, and the challenge they solve, um, along with um, how we can scale up very um, to a very high scales, we also come in at uh, a very uh, competitive cost as well, being the lowest compared to uh, 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 similar solutions. So what I want to talk about is uh, what's next. 
Um, so we talked um, earlier, if you go back to when we were talking about the ice house, we were talking about how um, one of the, the components is ingestion. And we really just focused on the streaming ingestion and data maintenance piece. Um, Coming very soon in public preview, uh, we are introducing file ingestion to Iceberg. Um, so uh, in addition to Kafka, a very similar um, uh, mechanism where you, you can point us at a, a uh, location on object storage and we monitor that and we're continuously loading it into an Iceberg uh, table. Um, so uh, we're, we're reading these, we're parsing the, the records and writing it to the iceberg uh, uh, table. Um, and as new files uh, land there, we're picking those up and continuously um, adding them uh, and appending them to the, the table. Um, as we're streaming ingest, we're also doing the automated data maintenance on these tables as well. Um, so that includes the compaction, the snapshot expiration, the orphan file remover, data retention, and, and stats collection. Um, so thank you for um, uh, coming to our presentation and uh, hearing us speak about um, the, the Ice House and uh, uh, Kafka streaming ingestion and data maintenance for the iceberg tables. Thank you. Thank you.